Hi guys! In this episode of Influences, I'm going to talk about one of my absolute favorite musicians, Alan Holdsworth, who he influenced and who he was possibly influenced by. I absolutely love his playing, so much so that I had two basses made by one of Alan's guitar makers, who is an incredible luthier, Bill DeLapp. In fact, one of the basses had a whammy bar. By the way, if anybody knows where these basses are, I'd be interested in buying them. And if you're interested in Bill DeLapp's guitars, you can find him on Facebook here. Now on to Influences. First, we'll begin with who he's influenced. According to the Earn the Necklace website, great guitarists like Carlos Santana, Frank Zappa, Pat Metheny, John McLaughlin, Peter Frampton, Joe Satriani, and Eddie Van Halen have confessed that Holdsworth influenced their work. Also, according to Wikipedia, Holdsworth was cited as an influence by a host of rock, metal, and jazz guitarists such as Eddie Van Halen, Joe Satriani, Greg Howe, Sean Lane, Richie Kotzen, John Petrucci, Alex Lifeson, Kurt Rosenwinkel, Ingve Malmsteen, Michael Romeo, Ty Tabor, Frederick Thordendahl, and Tom Morello. One person, in fact, who's received some criticism for sounding too much like Holdsworth is Bill Connors. In fact, in the May 1989 issue of Guitar World, when Holdsworth was asked about whether he was frustrated about Bill Connors' style being reminiscent of him, he replied, It doesn't frustrate me at all, but it would frustrate me if I were them because it's a waste of time. I mean, Bill Connors was, to me, an example of someone who had a very unique style. I think I first heard him on a Stanley Clark album I loved, and on that album, Bill sounded like Bill Connors. Now it's like, I don't know. Let's give Bill Connors a listen. Personally, I can definitely see the similarities, but I definitely also think that Bill has his own thing. So all of this begs the question, who was Alan influenced by? Well, the same Wikipedia article states that he was influenced greatly by such saxophonists as John Coltrane, Cannonball Adderley, Michael Brecker, and Charlie Parker, while some of his favorite guitarists were Django Reinhardt, Joe Pass, Wes Montgomery, Jimmy Rainey, Charlie Christian, and Hank Marvin. Furthermore, here's some other quotes I've collected over the years from various sources. When I started playing, I listened to a lot of music and had numerous influences. I never wanted to play music just like any particular musician. I just wanted to achieve a standard like the one that they had. If you go back and listen to those Cannonball Adderley, Charlie Parker, and John Coltrane recordings, the music comes out in a totally different way than if you listen to guys trying to play the same thing now. Those recordings were exciting, so fresh, far removed from the way people play similar things now. So at some point along the way, I found a used copy of the May 1989 issue of Guitar World magazine in a used bookstore. This was a treasure trove of insight to me, and among other things, it kind of explained the reasons why Alan was going for his legato technique. Specifically, he liked the legato playing of horn players, which we'll see in the following quotes. You know, I wish now more than ever that I'd been a horn player because there's all these new little wind instruments coming out for synthesizer control. God, it makes me want to try again with one of those. I've always tried to get the guitar to do something it didn't want to do. I started out using distortion to get sustain so I could work out the legato approach and not have notes sputtering out. They could flow out as though I were playing a horn. To me, one of the most tedious things I could ever imagine would be listening to a sax player tongue everything he played. On the one hand, I had to use distortion, quite unnatural to a percussive instrument like a guitar to get the kind of sustain and vocal quality I wanted from my instrument. As far as Alan's possible influences on the guitar, here's two more quotes from that article. To me, studying means studying yourself and what you think you're bad at, or trying to learn something more about harmony or chords or whatever, is something that can be done to good results. But studying a person is completely wrong. It shouldn't ever be done. Listening to them and being influenced by them, yeah. I'm influenced by everyone I hear. When I listen to Scott Henderson's album, it really affects me. I'm motivated by the chords he's playing. I try to retain the attitude through which I realize that there's something else and there's got to be more and more that I can learn to make my playing better. But I would never sit down and try to figure out anything that they did. Like I said, I'd like to become a really good improviser so that I can play on anything but in my own way without having utilized things that I just picked up from other people. Maybe I'll capitalize on that essence or the heart of it, but not so much specifically what he had in mind. That's something that's unique to that person like the way the guy looks. And this final quote, People waste time spending hours trying to clone something when they could be spending hours practicing something really different. There is one English guy I admire who never gets any mention, Steve Topping. There's a guy who's amazing. Steve plays really, really interesting harmonic lines and definitely, absolutely not bop. His lines are so unusual that the bop guys would have a hard time figuring them out. And he plays chords that I've never heard people play before. He has this unbelievable control of space. So who is Steve Topping and what does he sound like? Let's give him a listen.
This is from the Six String Sampler album by various artists from the French label Six Strings and a Plank of Wood. Judging from Alan's comments and the playing on this track, you might come to the conclusion that perhaps Alan was influenced by Steve. And in a small way, perhaps he was. But if we visit Steve Topping's website, overdown.com, we find these quotes. I met a lot of players in Leeds and got out and about playing, but it was my last year at college that I first saw Gary Husband when he was just 14 or 15 years old and still at school. At the same time, Gary and I were active getting bass players along to rehearsal studios or church halls. We needed someone to glue our all-out style together. The man that did that was Paul Carmichael, and really quite heroically, especially on a studio blow that we put together at Wood Cray Farm in 1980, later released as the CD What It Is. I had first heard Alan Holdsworth circa 1970 on English jazz radio broadcast playing with the great Pat Smith. I thought, what the fuck is that? I have no idea how he is doing that. Even worse, I like it. By 1980, Alan seemed to have formed his own complete musical world. In 1979, Gary met Alan and invited him down to a local church hall to blow with us. I had some stuff together, so I was up for it. Alan formed the band IOU with Gary and Paul Carmichael. It was a showcase for a striking new chordal style set in very strong personal compositions. Late in 1980, I joined Alan and Gary on a short Scottish tour as an improvising group under the name Handlebars. I was very aware of the extent to which my soloing had come up against its technical limits, developed as it was out of 90% alternate picking and my hero of the 1970s, John McLaughlin. So in late 81-82, this was coming to a head. I started a very intense period of guitar practice as muscle memory brain retraining to try and adapt some of Alan's pioneering legato methods. I wasn't in danger of doing a grotesque theft of musical persona that many have done and are still doing to Alan. I mean, I never once set out to try and copy his lines or chordal approach verbatim. But over the next years, I was undoubtedly falling under the spell of his wonderful sound. And from the sound comes the playing. From these quotes, we learn this. The drummer and bassist from Alan's IOU recording originally came from Steve Topping's band, who recorded an album called What It Is in 1980. Steve first heard Alan around 1970. Steve played with Alan. Steve recognized the technical limits of alternate picking and began adopting Alan's legato style. His first musical influence on guitar was John McLaughlin, and he was falling under the spell of his wonderful sound. Since What It Is was recorded in 1980 and Steve had been listening to Alan for 10 years more or less, it might be helpful to see what he sounded like at that time. Here are some excerpts from that CD. To me, Steve's playing is reminiscent of McLaughlin's, but with a little of Alan mixed in. It's a great combination and very unique. If we shuttle forward to 2007 and his most recent release, Late Flower, you can still hear some of Alan's influence, but with a unique twist. Even his soloing tone is somewhat different from Alan's. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this interesting and I'd love to hear your comments and opinions on this subject. Please be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Until next time.